everyone, I'm Mary Harrell with TAN Books. Thank you all for joining us today at the TAN Roundtable. The fullness of truth is found in the teachings of the church and encompasses tradition and scripture. What was handed down from the apostles still guides Holy Mother Church today through the Holy Spirit who would teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. That's from John chapter 14. In time, though, moral relativism has taken hold, perverting the good, the true, and the morally right understanding of our one holy Catholic Apostolic Church. So how can we best understand and appreciate the church's teaching on tradition and faith that has been handed down to us since apostolic times? Well, to that end, the TAN Roundtable this week is focusing on the errors of Protestantism and the fallout from separating tradition from faith. Joining us today for our discussion are our guests, Father Chad Ripperger, an expert in spiritual warfare and exorcism. He's being joined today by apologist and media master, Steve Cunningham, as well as historian and New York Times bestselling author, Joshua Charles. This is the TAN Roundtable, and you can find a new live discussion here every month. We're giving you personal access to our authors and our guests concerning the most pressing topics impacting the church and the world. Back to our speakers, Father Chad Ripperger. He's a leading, a leading expert in the area of spiritual warfare and exorcism, as I said before. He is a well-known and sought-after speaker. His education and firsthand experience make his presentations highly informative and interesting. He always provides a plentitude of insights into the Catholic faith and traditions. <clears throat> to that end, he provided the foreword for one of Tan's newest releases, Tradition and the Church, the story of sacred tradition, unfolding through the ages. Father Ripperger, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Josh Charles, he's a former White House speechwriter for Vice President, Vice President Mike Pence. He's also a number one Amazon bestselling author twice over now. He's a historian, a researcher, international speaker, as well as being a passionate defender of America's founding principles and the Catholic faith. Josh is also a concert pianist who has performed all over the US and Europe. My goodness, the term Renaissance man really fits here. Josh, welcome and thanks for being with us. Thank you, I'm really thankful to Tan and it's an honor. Steve and uh, Father have been heroes of mine coming in to the church from Protestantism. So it's, it's very humbling to be with both of you. Thank you. Fantastic. Steve Cunningham, welcome back to the Tan Roundtable. He's the founder of the Census Fidelium channel on YouTube, which to date has over 200,000 subscribers, 10 foreign language channels, and a whopping 75 million views. Steve is a grad of Spartanburg Methodist College. He's a cradle Catholic who reverted in 2011. He's a husband and a father of two. And with that many millions of views, Steve has arguably done more than any other Catholic media expert now to bring people into the faith and advance that faith. Steve, it's great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm just I'm sorry, I'm laughing at the interest. I'm like, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I'll send you the check for that. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, mean, I was going to say, Josh. Well, I, was gonna, I was just going to say, Joshua. I, when you said that Steve was one of your heroes, I'm like, yeah, I think he's everyone's hero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sense of Fidelium has played a huge role in not only coming into the church but deepening my faith and in spiritual life. So thank you. So I'm just some guy that gave the priest a megaphone. Is the priest doing their job? And I just it's figured important. out a way to get it's him out important. there. Yep. Yep. I can see him blushing. That's very cute. <laughs> Just a little housekeeping today. We'll be giving away a bundle of books to go with our theme, which includes a TAN classic called Facts About Luther, as well as The Catholic Controversy, A Defense of Faith, and as I mentioned above, Tradition and the Church by Father George A. Juice. No, I, 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 by Monsignor George. We'll call him that right now. <laughs> solid <read> <laughs> I can't get it. Um, those books will be given today away today at the end of the webinar, so please stay tuned to see if you are our winner. Also, stay tuned to the end. We'll be giving you a discount code for 40% off any of the books we're going to talk about today. Stay tuned for the, that as well at the end. So before we launch into our discussion of Protestants and errors today, we're going to kick it off with something a little bit lighter. I'd love for each one of you to tell me uh, what is your favorite TAN book, if you've got one or and or what book are you in the middle of right now what's on your reading stack so father ripager please kick us off tell us what you're reading um well 
actually right now I'm uh, reading the, uh, I mean, if, you, if you're talking about the main, the primary thing I'm reading, I'm actually reading the Disputed Questions uh, on Truth by St. Thomas Aquinas. So that's the primary thing I'm reading. But as far as the, my favorite Tan book, I kind of vacillate a little bit. It's, uh, it's either between Sparago, uh, Catechism Explained, or the um, uh, Ludwig Ott, which I don't know if, I, you guys are still publishing that, if I'm not mistaken, right? Oh, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's one of my favorite, just as a scholar, I tend to uh, look at that quite a bit more. But on the spiritual level, it would definitely be um, the humility of heart. I always tell everybody, nobody, nobody reads that book without getting a little bloodied around the ears, you know. So, um, but th yeah, so that's those are probably my my favorites. Mm -hmm. The Dartan Book of the Year last year, Humility of Heart, wonderful. Yep, good for everyone. Steve, I know your book stack. If that's it behind you, we're in trouble. But give us a couple of your top titles. Oh, that's just the uh, that was just extras that I just ain't moved to the other room yet. Uh, I'll go with just uh, the three pack you got going on the co the controversies. I remember uh, Father Bunkley gave a sermon basically from the controversies back when I was at St. Paul's in Spartanburg, and my brother and I were going, mm, "Yeah, kick it at him." Uh, but yeah, reading uh, now uh, that's uh, the only book in English on St. Peter the Martyr, Peter of Verona, uh, the latter divine ascent. Uh, the Jesus Prayer and Invitation of St. Joseph that Father Kalth wrote. Mm, that's fantastic. Awesome. Josh, over to you. Yeah, easily uh, St. Francis de Sales, the controversy. Um, it played a big role in my conversion, uh, cemented a lot of things. And uh, it actually, we can talk about this later perhaps, but it exposed me to some different things that um, I wasn't even fully aware of about what Calvin believed. And it sounded too preposterous to be true, like, oh, this must be Catholic propaganda, but I actually found the source for the quote that mm -hmm. St. Francis de Sales provided, and it was accurate. And um, so, yeah, St. Francis, de Sales, I think it's probably the single best Catholic apologetic work vis-a-vis -vis Protestantism that's that's available even today, so. Mm, fantastic, wonderful titles. So to go ahead and start us off on our topic today, Father, I'd like to go with you. As I said, you wrote the, um, forward to our book here for tradition and the church. So mm -hmm. please give us some definitions that we can work with. Uh, what is tradition with a capital T, as we say in Catholicism? Um, how is it different from sacred tra tradition? Are they the same? Mm -hmm. And how is it different strictly from scripture? Well, Mary, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but the distinction between capital T and, and little t tradition is a modernist invention. Mm, really? Yes, it is. It started, it didn't, that type of distinction didn't really start. So let me just take, make a couple of statements about uh, Aegis and then I'll give you, give you some of the background to that. So originally there was a book written called um, Tractatus de Divina Tra uh, Traditionis. It was written by um, a guy by the name of Franz Lane. And Franz Lane, this became the gold standard for any discussion on tradition whatsoever even modernists like Congar and the like who came later and discussed tradition everybody had to at least nod that they had read this book because it was the book that uh, it, it's probably the best book that was ever written on the history of the church on tradition and the um uh, it's even better than some of robert bellerman stuff that he incorporates all of that well, what Aegis did in his work, um, The Church and the Tradition, which you guys have republished, is he took that and then he boiled it down and made it uh, um, uh, approachable to the lay faithful. Okay, so what happens is, is when the modernists come along a little bit later, just before the second and after the Second Vatican Council, historically, the church had always considered, and, you, and all the authors, and you see this actually in Franz Lane, but it's also somewhat in Aegis, that there's actually... It's not, a dis it's not a distinction between what do we have to believe and what don't we believe. It's rather within the Catholic tradition itself, there's grades of requirements or certitude regarding what we're bound to believe based upon the particular source. And so historically, that's why they never made the, historically the church never made that distinction or the authors never made that distinction. It gets made later because they basically want to cut it off that basically unless it's been formally defined by the church um, or it's in some papal document, then you don't have to believe it. And they say, well, those, all those other things you don't have to believe, those are the little T, and then the stuff you do have to believe, that's the big T. When in point, in fact, historically, 
both in the way the church has talked, but then also in the way that um, uh, Franz Lien and all the subsequent authors actually after Bellarmine talked, is that there's different degrees of certitude regarding a proposition. And so within the tradition, um, the more that's part of the tradition, then the more you're bound to, to adhere to it. If um, So obviously something that's de fide, you have to believe it in order to be Catholic. Something that's part of the um, common opinion of the theologians or what they call the sententia communis, you would have an obligation to adhere to it unless you had grave reason to the contrary. So there was varying degrees of certitude about these things. The only ones that the church would consider that you know, you're not really bound to believe and that you could host it would be what we call pious tradition in the past. So the advantage, and so what's, what's happened is, um, and that, I think that's one of the things that's really important, what's happened in the church since then is this whole loss of the fact that there are various aspects of the tradition which require different degrees of assent have been lost and it's being replaced by people who just want to basically make it cut and dry, whereas historically it was never really that way, if that makes oh. sense. Sure. Steve and Josh, as, as converts and reverts, were you aware of that distinction, the modernist invention of the small T versus capital T, that that does not, that should not exist, that does, that's not a thing? Oh, yeah. I saw it in a Cracker Jack box one time. Yeah, that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> Who didn't know that? <laughs> no, that's, that's what I love about the channels, because uh, I, I consider like the, uh, if you remember the old hair club for men commercials, I'm not only the president, I'm a client. Uh, so, like I said, father's done that couple times in lectures and so i've heard that and read his books on tradition so that's the only way i've ever heard because i never got taught that as a kid and i went to catholic school till sixth grade and all that jazz and can take count on one hand you know how many times i heard that in a sermon outside of a mike dicka sermon long ago but so no we weren't i wasn't taught that as a kid because we weren't taught you know as we as we've said before and i know others have said it we've had the our our faith taken like stolen from us from the past and so it's trying not to be bitter about that so we're, hey, we're, we're learning as we go <laughs> josh would you add to that yeah i well the first thing i'd say is uh i've learned very quickly and it's unfortunate it's it's actually not funny but you know gallows humor that uh, usually when somebody says i went to catholic school i can be sure uh that what i'm about to hear next is not good um but uh <laughs> That's unfortunate. It's, it's sad. Like I said, it's gallows humor. It's not to be made light of, but you know, gall we, we laugh so we don't cry. But uh, no, I knew the gist of it, not in all the fullness of what Father just explained, but um, I knew it honestly because of the oath that I took coming into the church uh, through F an FSSP parish out here in the Sacramento area, because that oath outlines um, that more complete definition of tradition uh, that Father mm -hmm. just outlined. And so um, I, I've had a number of friends who come, came into the church who came in through the more normal RCIA. Um, and, uh, you know, they had to take a, a, an oath and it was, it was all good and orthodox, but, uh, but it was not nearly as detailed as the one I had to take, um, which included, you know, a lot of stuff related to the council of Trent Vatican one, uh, indulgences just, it was, it was about a three page oath. I'll just put it that way. And it, it makes very clear that the sense of tradition is, is uh, very much like what Father was describing. So Father, to go back for us, well, now we know what, what tradition is not, it's not two separate things. <laughs> what, what is it and why is it different from scripture? Um, well, primarily, uh, well, tradition, if you actually look at the way the Fathers of the Church write it and the theologians throughout time, tradition is the totality. So there's a, two, there's a twofold distinction. It's the totality of what is passed on, which actually includes scripture. In fact, tradition actually predates scripture because um, originally stuff was passed on verbally and those things remained uh, verbal for some time. Some of them, not the totality of them, were written down in scripture. Um, and so the scriptures then, then is sometimes distinguished between what they call instead of tradition in the broader sense, but tradition in the more restrictive sense, which is counter distinguished from scripture, that it's the, all those things that are not contained in scripture. But tradition is just merely the totality of what's passed on um, in the church uh, as part of the deposit of faith. So that's kind of the generic definition. So it would be the totality of what's being passed on. And so that's how it's distinguished between scripture and um, uh, against scripture. Obviously, we know there's all sorts of things um, that are in scripture uh, or that are in tradition that are not contained in scripture that we're still required to believe as Catholics. But also it just says it right in 
the, the last, uh, you know, one of the last books, uh, uh, the last um, verses of John, he says, you know, and if we, you know, we did not recount all the things that Christ had said and did, and if we did, it would be the volumes would fill the world kind of a thing. And so there's all sorts of stuff that never got written down, but those things were passed on. The tradition includes not just the teachings, as, but it also includes um, what we call the elements of sanctification, such as the sacraments, holy orders, the authority structure of the church, the power over the di diabolic, all those things which Christ gave to, because the deposit of faith isn't just teachings, even though that is an integral part of it. It's the totality of everything that he passed on, even the structure of the church, everything is what's passed on from tradition and will remain intact, even, you know, until he returns. Yeah. Steve, I would say there's a lot of misunderstanding, uh, not just with Protestants, but with Catholics about what sacred tradition is and is not. And there's even an open hostility towards the idea from many uh, Protestants that we encounter. So, Steve, could you explain what what would a Protestant think tradition is in the Catholic sense? <clears throat> and how do we refute that in debates? I think they just look at it as anything that we do, really. I mean, the praying of statues or sacramentals or uh going to mass uh, everything they, they they just keep throwing at the you know don't hold up traditions of men as the uh, as the scripture says but they don't take they take that out of context where christ isn't talking about that it's talking about the pharisees at the sense but these guys talk about this and everything we do so it's it's more like a generic thing i don't even know they know what they're upset about i mean joshua i think he, you're the, you're the convert you might know more about what y'all actually think but uh, every time I've experienced it in the uh, the Bible Belt here, quote unquote, where it's the most anti-Catholic areas, uh, Greenville, South Carolina, where Bob Jones is, they have no idea. I, I've asked them before; they have no idea what they don't like. It's the basically the, the tradition of theirs is they hate what we don't what we know, but they don't know why. It's a, a blind obedience, I guess you could say to it. So I, I just don't think they even understand what we even do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say most, I mean, I always took my faith very seriously from a very young age. I was always reading, you know, mostly apologetics type stuff. Maybe you guys are familiar with names like William Lane Craig, Josh McDowell, Robbie Zacharias, who just passed away. And unfortunately, a bunch of scandal came out about him. Um, so I always took my faith very seriously, read the Bible a lot, read Luther, read Calvin. And um, uh, for me, it was just recognizing that to even, I mean, this is a very common argument, but I think it's irrefutable that to even know what the books of scripture are, I needed something outside of scripture. It was, it was a very syllogistic, irrefutable proposition that if scripture is your sole infallible source of authority, then you can't even arrive at what the canon is. And this was actually ironically sealed for me by a Protestant, a very well-known intellectual Protestant named R.C. Sproul. He died a few years ago a uh, reformed guy and he had a, he has a ministry called uh Le legionnaire or legionnaire whatever and uh, very anti-catholic um you know nice guy but he gave a lecture on the canon and he basically said as far as classical protestantism can go to the extent that's not an oxymoron um we we can only say that scripture is a fallible collection of infallible books Oh, wow. And he would also, yeah, it was a quite remarkable admission. And for me, that that sealed the scripture issue. I was still studying, like, is there any Protestant way to get around this problem? Because if you can't even come up with the canon of scripture without tradition, that means you can't you can't know the contents of the faith with certainty. And to me, it just struck me as absurd that if God is going to reveal something, it necessarily must be clear. Otherwise, there's no point in revealing it. God does not give us things just to be confusing. Um, that's what uh, the would-be God does, uh, Satan. And so, um, so yeah, the, the canon argument was huge for me and, and recognizing even from the mouths of Protestants that the absolute furthest they could go without any, you know, notion of sacred binding tradition that was, that was on par with scripture, um, they couldn't even come up with scripture. Hmm. Wow. Uh, Father Ripiger, you say in your foreword uh, to Monsignor's book here that it is one of the best texts written in English on tradition, and rightly it mm -hmm. is, but certainly there aren't many books like it. You can't point to many books about tradition um, that we have today to reference. So why do you think tradition seems to be as yet so unexamined by yet uh, older Catholic, modern Catholic, really any Catholic author? Even by traditionalists. 
<laughs> which Steve and I have talked about that. Um, but I, I think that it really just boils down to, um, you know, it's kind of hard to say. I think, I think part of it has to do, I think it's a complex issue, but I think the primary issue has to do with the whole modernist problem because the modernist problem basically shifts the standard for what is true about what we believe from objective reality of which tradition is a part. It's an external standard to which we have to conform to uh, basically the, the interior becomes imminent. That is, it's the interior, what my personal experience is constitutes the, the, the determination of what I'm going to actually believe. So that principle of imminence in modernism has caused people to just think that they don't really need to study. They don't need to uh, know more about their faith because if they if it feels good then it must be true if it doesn't it doesn't and I think that that's made its way even into a lot of Catholics so I think um, one of the observations I made in an article some years ago was the fact that uh, modernism I've actually come to the conclusion it's in we're in the sixth stage originally I thought we were in the fifth but the fifth stage is is that oh. the intellectual gas ran out so by the time you get to the 60s 70s and 80s the intellectual gas, theological uh, considerations and discussion of theological topics by modernists imploded because in the end there's no real rigor because what makes something rigorous academically or theologically, philosophically is the fact that there's a reality to which you have to pr have very precise judgment and clarity about and that just all collapsed because it all just became amorphous in relationship to our personal experience. So I think that that's one of the primary reasons why you just don't see people even studying the tradition or anything like that. Whereas if you're not, if you're a realist and you realize that the philosophical underpinnings of modernism are just false and that the church has already condemned it, then you realize there has to be an external standard. And that's one of the reasons when, when I first came across Aegis' book, I'm like, this is perfect for your average layman to be able to read and get a sense of here's the external standard, the rule of faith that I need to conform to, at least as to the structure, so that I know what I have to conform to in order to know that my faith is right. So I think I think the reason you just don't see people reading um, or studying the tradition is simply because they just don't see the need to. Mm. Mary, so, do you mind if I add one comment off of what Father said? Because it's Please. directly, related. I mentioned earlier a quote of Calvin from uh, St. Francis de Sales, and the quote was about the canon, and it was quoting Calvin's uh, French Confession of Faith. I think it's like 1559, somewhere in there. And uh, Calvin, in the section on the canon, uh, appeals to the uh, illuminate the inward illumination of the Holy Spirit. That's his exact phraseology. Mm -hmm. So it's you know, I don't think many Protestants realize that that Protestantism as far, uh, I would argue, as far as a civilizational force, you know, something that's not, you know, some Gnostic sect here or her heresy there, but as something that actually grabbed hold of a large chunk of Christian civilization is thoroughly modernist and even Gnostic uh, because that, yeah. you know, the church, the church through councils couldn't be infallible, uh, but, but, but the individual could in their perception of, of you know, an, a, a very necessary datum of the faith. And so, Steve, I didn't. I realized I didn't fully answer your previous question, but I would ultimately say, it's the Protestant idea that there are these accretions through history, these barnacles on the ship, so to speak, that uh, they they presume to kind of no, these aren't these are these are man-made things, um, but but when they're appealing to the inward illumination of the Holy Spirit, there's no longer, as Father just said, that external standard of truth. It's completely internalized, and ironically, someone like Calvin was very much against that. He he had a he, he appealed to it to get out of the church, but then he was ruthlessly against it, against Protestant lay people, because he asserted mm. lay people didn't have the authority to interpret scripture. Uh, lay people didn't have the authority to make such claims. He actually executed some of them. Um, and so anyway, that would just be some details based off what Father said, that, that Protestantism, I would argue, is the root uh, civilizational uh, force behind modernism. It started with Protestantism. And Josh yeah, and I think that... Go ahead, Steve. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, just the, off that last question, they they have their own traditions that it's basically Absolutely. their own. You have to you have to like their own. I mean, the Bible is a tradition. It got yeah. handed back down. Sola fide, sola scriptura is a tradition. So it, it's it's a proof. It's kind of like you hear today: uh, approved conspiracy theories versus unapproved. The approved ones are get get on CNN and MSNBC. 
It's the unapproved ones, and that's Protestant. They don't like the unapproved ones. They like the approved ones. Yeah, and it basically just boils down to, Steve, is that in the end, the Protestants can't argue that there's no such thing as tradition. We all agree there's a tradition because even they have one. The question is, which tradition is it going to be? That's the only real issue. Um, and in something in relationship to what Joshua said, the principle of imminence, which came via the Catholic Church, came via philosophical collapse. Whereas, uh, but it was the same, exact same principle as the Protestant illumination theory. It was the same thing. It just it got brought in through a different avenue because the Catholics wouldn't accept it unless it was given a different kind of flavor, so to speak. So would we say here that tradition is the defining feature that distinguishes between Catholicism and Protestantism? Do the, do the sacraments fall under that or above it? Where is the ranking of what is the one defining feature between Catholicism and Protestantism? Do we agree on that? Um, I don't think it's, well, the sacraments are obviously part of that. I would, I think it ultimately boils down to the one distinguishing feature ultimately boils down to um, the authority, ultimately, because it's the authority to whom the passing on of the tradition was given. It's the authority whose place it is to judge what is actually part of the tradition and what is not. It's the authority's place to make sure that um, everything that is understood in relationship to the tradition is accurate and that the actual perpetuation of the tradition ultimately boils down to um, the authority. So it's really the authority that Jesus Christ gave to the apostles and their successors, which is the primary thing through which the tradition is passed and through which we have its guarantee. Because ultimately, it's because of the fact that, um, and I think Aegis, it might even be in Aegis, I know it's in Franzeline, but it ultimately boils down to the fact that it's because of the magisterium, that is the authority of the church that tells us that this thing is to be believed. And then the reason it's to be believed is because it's an uninterrupted tradition from the time of Christ. And it contains those things necessary for salvation. It's because they tell us is why we actually have to give assent which is ultimately why they that that's why the authors end up talking about well, what happens if certain magisterial members start deviating from the tradition and which is what we have to believe they said well then ultimately you have to fall back to what the tradition itself which still contains the authority as it has been proposed throughout tradition or throughout history so i i mean for me it would be that the primary distinguishing factor is the authority which is precisely why the tradition in catholicism and the tradition in protestantism is different because we actually think there is somebody who has authority and they may or may not. Mm -hmm. Father, uh, you've assembled a beautiful collection of prayers in your book on deliverance prayers for the laity, very popular mm -hmm. in Catholic circles. Uh, what is the best way to pray for people, our, our siblings, uh, adult children who have left the faith, maybe joined a Protestant church? And additionally with that, um, what is it that keeps people from returning to the church that have fallen away? Is our actual demons involved in that process? Um, yeah, actually, I think they are, but not, I, I don't think demons are under every rock. Sometimes people are just wed to their sin. They just like sin and they don't want to come into the church because they have to change. But I tell people there's a positive and a negative to people's conversion. And this is even true, like even if they're on their deathbed and they don't want to see a priest, like as in, in you see with parents and children dealing with that with their parents, etc., um, or that the kids have left the faith and they don't want to come back or what have you. I tell them there's a positive and a negative. The positive side is they actually have to have grace. They actually actually have to have grace in order to convert because the conversion is a, a conversion to a supernatural deposit of faith and a supernatural life, and so they have to have grace in order to do that. So you have to keep praying for that. On the other hand, demons, because they have access to our emotions and our imagination, they can actually influence people's um, reactions to the grace. So even if God gives them grace, they can inspire fear like, oh, well, you know, if you if you become Catholic, well, then, you know, you, you're going to lose your friends or you're going to have to stop this particular behavior in your life or you're, you're not going to be able to get this or that or what have you. So they can use our emotions against us and also our perceptions. And so I tell people saying a binding prayer or just saying prayers to keep demons out of these people's lives, to block them. So in the binding prayer, I just tell people bind any demon that is keeping them from converting and do it on a regular basis. So you can use that particular um, prayer or other prayers, consecrating them to Our Lady on a consistent basis, plus as well as saying the positive stuff. 
And that's what I've seen as the most effective um, way to convert. In fact, I have a relative whose husband was a very, he was a man of natural virtue. Everybody in the family really liked this guy, but he was a Protestant. And he just, it, he, it, it seemed like he was stubborn. But in the end, so I, at, at one point, I just said to my sister, here, say this binding prayer against any demon that's keeping him from coming into the church. She started saying it within 10 months he was in the church, even oh, though she had been wow. praying for 20 years. Praise so God. the point being is, is this, this gives you an indicator that if we, have, if we can get the demons out of life, people will generally speak and follow, hopefully, not absolutely, but they'll follow the way of grace. And so that's why we do both. Mm. Josh, as a convert, what is your take on that? Oh, I wouldn't presume to speak on uh, demonology when Father River is in the room, so I, I don't, I don't have additional opinions. Uh, but Father, is that prayer? And because I actually have some family members who are going through some tough things right now, uh, is that is that binding prayer in uh, in the book? I, I think I have that book. Yeah, prayer. it's deliverance prayers for the laity. Yeah, it's yeah. in that okay. book. Okay, great. Yeah. And at, on the bottom of his footnote, if this doesn't work, bop him on the head with a bat. <laughs> yeah, there. <laughs> Plan B. <laughs> Plan B. <laughs> Steve, do you have Protestants in your life who would take umbrage with the idea that there are, are demons keeping them in, in their faith of choice? Oh, yeah. No, I, how, what is it? 98% <laughs> of the guys I used to talk to don't, uh, don't talk to me anymore. I mean, I, I'm in the South and we're surrounded by Protties. Mm -hmm. uh, Yes, uh, man. There I, is an I, example on Paul's. We don't have enough time to go through all that that stuff. I mean, my brother's post, uh, them texting me, up, "What's wrong with your brother? He's so arrogant about it, He's saying the church is the uh, one true church and all that." I go, yeah. So, my I remember I, that was my first apologetic was uh, telling the guys, "You're a SEC, you know, South Carolina Gamecock fan, right? Is the SEC the best uh, football uh, 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 college football uh, conference in the in the union?" He goes, "Yeah, yeah. Is that arrogant or truth?" And I, eight years later, I still don't have that response. But uh, <laughs> yeah, they, uh, you know, for everything from morals to whatever, you change, you start living that way, uh, you figure out who uh, who your friends were real quick. Yeah. So yeah, most of those got most of my friends I grew up with. Yeah, we barely talk anymore. I got one left. He's a uh, he's a Lutheran, and uh, I don't know why he still talks to me because I will bash him off the head. <laughs> with things like you know, I went to his baptism, his kid's baptism, and the, the whatever the cleric was is, uh, what's your name? What's the name? Bryce. Oh, that's a good Lutheran name. I go, uh, time out. Uh, outside of Martin and Luther, what's a good Lutheran name? And, uh, <laughs> you know, things like that. And just tell him, you know, you guys just have this. Look at what beauty we have over here. And it's, I don't know what's holding them back. Maybe it's just, uh, you know, uh, countless years of being in that world, being surrounded by other friends, seeing what happened with me, with our friends, just being basically, you know, pushed aside and uh, ostracized in a sense. But uh, I don't know. Just, yeah, I, I, they're a ton around me. Uh, I think they would, if I told them they had a demon in them, they would, uh, <laughs> I don't know what, I don't know what the reaction would be from them, but trust me, I, I do the same thing with the, uh, with Father Recommend. And uh, as Father Mateo says, there's a price for, the price needs to be paid. So do penance for him. Josh, you were going to mention something uh, by Dr. Paul Thigpen. Oh, in the book. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I thought Steve was was done. Um, oh, you're good. So, you're good. Don't worry about it. You know, Paul Thigpen, I believe, wrote a I'm forgetting the name of the book at the moment, but he has an example of an exorcist. I think it was in Poland. They were meeting with a Calvinist who was seemingly possessed. And and I'm, I'm honestly forgetting the details, but somehow the demon responded well to a copy of Calvin's Institutes. Uh and, and that was an indication to the exorcist that uh, there was possession. So, wow, I'm forgetting the details, but yeah, I was, yeah. I mean, that that's what's so, I mean, I definitely, I honestly, I don't recommend telling Protestants they have a demon in them because I don't, I don't know that. Um, and I, and I, right. unless I get an, uh, you know, a, an indication otherwise, I'll, I'll assume goodwill. Um, but, but, um, you know, I think, uh, Many Protestants, uh, if you approach them with an acknowledgement of their genuine concerns, which are to be faithful to scripture and whatnot, um, that's a great way to start asking some basic questions about, well, where does scripture come from? And, and Jesus said the Holy Spirit would be with the apostles till he came back. And so, 
you know, how does that work? And, and the, the Holy Spirit would guide the church into all truth. How does that work? And so I, that would be the approach that I would recommend. So, yeah, that leads us to a question from one of our viewers, Marvin, who asks, how does one approach a friend, as you're saying, Josh, or someone who is born Protestant, who through no fault of their own, really in their raising, doesn't know about the church? How do we introduce them to Catholicism uh, with charity and truth? Father? Um, actually, I think that's a good question for Joshua, but I think that the, um, the, uh, I think the, I think the primary thing is two things, uh, truth, uh, through with charity. I mean, it really does boil down to being charitable to them because then they see there's no animus. If you actually see what's what, what they, what's what well, you're seeking, what's good for them. But then also the truth, I think, I think a lot of times they're, especially if they're, um, a lot of the Protestants today are uncatechized even in their own religion so a lot of times they're actually more open if you just if you're just very rational calm and they see that you're a normal person and you just want the best for them a lot of times just presenting them things here and there will get them thinking and then they'll actually that will that's kind of the segue because i think that you know even though they're protestants they still have reason they still have use of reason and and as a result if you appeal to that i think that's the segue into getting them to give you know serious considerations to what they believe. Mm -hmm. Josh, that sounds like what you were saying before. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you from my experience, um, the way it really started for me is I had about a decade's worth of just studying scripture carefully, and I couldn't reconcile Paul and Christ. If if what Paul meant was what most Protestant sects in one form or another said that he meant. And so I actually tell my Protestant friends, reading the Bible carefully is what really sent me toward Catholicism. Uh, and I could give a million examples of that. Um, but, uh, and th but I didn't read a single church father until June of 2017. But by that time, I was already convinced pretty much that some Protestant ideas were wrong. And I, I will say the Lord has seen fit to, I mean, I'm constantly having new conversations with Protestant friends. And a lot of it has happened, you know, social media brings a lot of evil into this world, but not, it doesn't necessarily have to. I mean, as Steve knows with census fidelium and whatnot, but I just posted church father quotes all the time. It so many conversations, so many conversions. I've had a number of friends who've already converted. Some who are very close. I mean, just today, I don't know him, but a famous Protestant, well, he's not Protestant really anymore, but named Cameron Bertuzzi has a channel called uh, capturing Christianity. And he just announced today that he's converted because um, he did an in-depth study of the papacy. So, um, but in my experience, many thoughtful Protestants have actually already kind of maybe thought about some of the issues, like, well, how do I get the Bible? Why are we endlessly dividing? There's clearly no uh, basis for that in scripture. So if you kind of scratch the surface with some Protestants, um, I've often found that there's an openness, not with everybody, and I think Steve definitely knows that, and I definitely know it as well, um, but if you just present the truth and love, um, it, it, it can go, it can go a long way. Hmm. Steve, we have another question from one of our viewers, Mary Kay. She asks, why did Protestants remove the seven deuterocanonical <laughs> books from the Bible? And that's a question a lot of apologists field all the time, but go ahead and walk us through that one. Well, let me because, just uh, think just back to what they said on the last one. Cause I was, I mean, I've been doing that for years going straight St. Paul street team giving out medals and rosaries. I mean, I had the people had mentioned the, uh, the anti-Catholic Bob Jones University. We had the oh, entire gosh. festival walk around with rosaries, all blessed. Uh, did that many, many festivals here in the South. Um, Uber, I have, you know, people get in my car. I had rosaries. I had miraculous medals. I had CDs strategically. So when I'm doing 70, I could figure out which CD that person needed. It was, and it was color coded. So if, if they were black, I had a black thing on it. No kidding. White had white. Spanish had had green. I had it so I could easily see it and give it to them. And I remember having one guy. He was uh, he's from Guadalajara, and we were talking about the Cristeros. And by the end of the trip to the airport, he was wanting he was looking at the movie trailer and was talking about wanting baptism. Wow. So it's all about it's sales. You got to know who you're <coughs> talking to. You have to know the product. You have to know the person. So if you one, you can't. You, if you don't know the faith, you can't give it to another. Uh, if they have a question for you, then somebody usually nobody has the humility to say, "I don't know," but I'll go get that answer. They're going to spew off something that they don't know, and 
or if or they don't know what they're doing, they're over talking instead of listening, and then not showing joy. Uh, the the great example of uh, Francis de Sales about the him talking to a guy. I think it was a Turk, maybe maybe, maybe no, it was a Calvinist, and uh, he thought he was just full of it. And then everyone's out of the church, and he's he's hiding behind a pillar, and he sees Francis goes up and genuflects the same way he did when everyone else in the in the church was in there. He goes, he believes what he says. And that made him convert to go to conversion. So I, there's that whole line: no one's ever been converted through arguments, so actions. I mean, you could tell you can we can give the arguments to a blue in the face, but if we act like a bunch of pagans out in the real world, that's not going to change anybody. No joy. I mean, walk around today. This should be an easy time to convert people. Smile on your face. Why is that guy happy? It's terrible out there. Yeah, <laughs> because you're Catholic. I mean, three cheers for joy, um, the excitement, charity. All that goes in, but it's it's a sales thing. You got to know the person. You got to know how to interact with humans. Uh, some people are better online. I like being face to face talking to them because then you can see the expressions, you can eye contact, tone of voice. Uh, no no screw ups in typing or someone getting upset if I didn't like how you spoke to me, etc. But uh, but that's that's it. I've been in sales all my life, so I was you know going to doctors and talking to them and hey, you build that trust. You shouldn't get this product even if it's ours. Because it stinks. You should get this one, even if it's not ours. And that builds a trust. Now they're buying from you. Same thing with the, you relate that to the faith. But yeah, do the canonical. Uh, yeah, you go go to Catholic Answers, find them more of the uh, official, the great answers for that one. But it goes back to Luther and Calvin then saying that they uh, they didn't like it. I mean, the first King James Bible had all 70, was it 73 books? Uh, had the, it's, it had the, it had the, had the, all of them before they th- tossed them out. But Luther didn't like the uh, St. James, there's a pistol of straw. Uh, as one priest said, that uh, they didn't like a lot of the cool stories, like Tobias, uh, Maccabees. They just didn't like it. Um, Prayer to Saints, the, the Catholic stuff. Ecclesiasticus, I mean, you can't read Ecclesiasticus 24-24 unless you got the not, old, not, not actually the Bible, the NAB, that doesn't have that entire chapter in it. But uh, that's a tradition that we took out. Uh, but yeah, Josh, you want more on the Deuterocanonical ones, but I'd say just go to Catholic.com on the YouTube channel and get those answers for you. Oh yeah, no, I, I would I would emphasize one of the ways I've initiated conversation with Protestants is at the end of the day, the intellect played a huge role in my conversion. But at the end of the day, and I think this is a very important point to make, it's ultimately love, love of Christ. You know, as Saint Thomas More said in, in the movie, in the movie at least, it's ultimately a matter of love. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. Well, as a Protestant, that was what I was having great angst about, is I couldn't know with certainty what those commandments were. Because people I knew who were, as far as I could tell, good, well-intended, educated people, were all disagreeing about it. Divorce, contraception, uh, can you lose your salvation? I mean, so many issues. Um, and if, if you want to love Christ, you need to know what he commands with certainty. Um, and, uh, so anyway, that, that's the thing that I've often taken as well is because Protestants, many of them are genuinely, I think, trying to love Christ as best they can with what they know. I, I, I will give them the benefit of the doubt on that. Um, so, but, it, but if they're all disagreeing, that's a huge source of, uh, that's an apologetic opening for us. So. And don't give them too much credit. They don't know as much as they think they know. Oh, I, I, know. No, I completely agree. I mean, yeah. I, I, I had a Catholic guy in my fraternity in college uh, and I later apologized to him for being so, you know, I wasn't rapidly anti-Catholic. I didn't think Catholics weren't Christians, but I thought they were kind of like quasi semi apostate pagans almost, you know, I had kind of vague ideas about it, but, uh, but no, I, I agree with you completely. Yeah. Father, you had mentioned the magisterium before and how important that is to our understanding of tradition. So a question from Daniel that I think is really relevant, uh, especially in this papacy at times is that, how do you hold fast to truth and tradition uh, while staying humble and obedient when non-infallible magisterial statements seem to yeah. conflict? Um, I actually wrote an entire book on this, <laughs> but it's it's just it's called magisterial authority, and it's actually how you how you actually deal with it. It really boils down to what's actually in another book, which is um, we. 
first of all, we as Catholics know, for example, if some German bishops get, get, get up, gets up there and says that I think we should allow gay marriage or I think that we should, um, you know, that the, the sins against the Sixth Commandment are no longer binding, you know, no longer sins, we immediately know as Catholics that that's just not right. We know it. And we call that the census fidelium. But the reason we know that is because uh, even though that particular magisterial member is saying something contrary to the faith, it's precisely because we have a separate rule of faith. So the, the distinction that they always made in the past was what they called the proximate and the remote rule of faith. So the proximate rule of faith, normally speaking, is that the magisterium um, gives us the tradition and those two coming together, what they pass to us, that's the rule of faith, right? So they call that the proximate rule. So the magisterium is the proximate rule. And by proximate, I mean, it's under normal circumstances, um, even though we don't, we're not living there now necessarily, but under normal circumstances, you just do what the magisterium tells you because under normal circumstances, they're going to tell you what the truth of the Catholic faith actually is. But then they, the authors are very clear. If, the, if a particular magisterial member fails or members failed, then as Catholics, and we do this just intuitively, we go back to the remote rule. What has the church always taught? As St. Vincent Loren said, what has the church taught always, everywhere, and in all circumstances? And we know that the church has always taught that sins against the six commandments are grave matter. We've always known that the church has said that women can't be priests. We've always known. And so we just, as Catholics, we intuitively go back to that knowing, well, we know that's not what we were to believe. So it's, uh, under, like I said, under normal circumstances, you would follow the proximate rule. But when you recognize when something's clearly contrary to what you know is true as a Catholic, then you revert back to um, the uh, remote. Uh, so when the proximate rule fails, you convert back to the remote rule. But as I mentioned a little bit earlier, a little bit kind of on the side, is that even the remote rule contains the whole of the magisterium throughout tradition as it's teaching, even though it's not the current living magisterium. That's where the obedience lies, is that ultimately our obedience lies first and foremost to what Christ has taught, and the magisterium is the means by which that's transmitted. And so our primary obligation is not to the means. Our primary obligation is to what Christ has taught us. And normally speaking, you would follow both of those because they go hand in hand. But when they don't, you ultimately have to obey Christ. As it says in Scripture, it's better to obey God than men. And so that's, that's generally how it works. Mm, fascinating. Steve, would you add anything to that on the current climate magisterial teaching or, or error? Oh, just like how the one of the questions prior you asked about uh, why is books like this not more read, read more or published more? Is if people would focus not on the blogs posted and read about the drama that's going on in the church and you know, so much drama in the OBC uh, and focus on things that would make you holier and be, get to heaven and read the tradition you would be so much better i mean because personally i don't give to you know what's about what reading about those things i'm focusing on becoming better learning about the church learning about the religion learning about the faith yes i have it in the back of my mind i know what's going on I'm not saying to completely ignore it no as i think fathers talked about before just know enough that for your state in life really so if you're focused on that and that's bringing you down like another uh, uh lecture he gave on um uh, negativity it will bring you down it'll take your joy away so if that affects you in how you could how do you convert somebody if you're just down in the pits i can't believe the church is this way it's it's a wreck it's this uh there's a book by philip hughes the church in crisis it's always in a crisis in some sense or another uh three chairs for joy that's a, from a quote from a, a bishop of uh saint theophane Bernard, who's all his priests were in vietnam getting killed and his motto was three chairs for joy anyways even though they were just getting pounded in the ground out there. He was joyful. And not just some uh, polyamory, just uh, polyamoric person just going around smiling just for any reason. No, because you're Catholic. You should be happy over that. You, because you went to the sacraments, you had you went to Mass. You should be excited over that. Confession, happy over that. So, yeah, these there's things going down. I think it's a great time. I love this stuff, but I'm weird. I think it's great that, you know, everything's going down in a hell in a handbasket around us, but we're... It's kind of like that matrix. We are still here in the set. <laughs> yeah, I just, just by way of uh, just observation relationship, something to see. I always tell people, look at the prophecies told us this was going to happen. Yeah. And that tells us that what the church teaches and the prophecies and the saints throughout time 
what they said was true because we're seeing it happen. But that also means everything else they taught us was true. And so the light will come, but we're going to have to go through some stuff that's difficult. But it also means that the Catholic Church is 100 percent true. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. Yeah, Mary, that this is a topic I've studied a lot the last few years. Um, I won't go into all my thoughts on it. it's too big of a topic, but uh, frankly, some of the eschatological aspects of things and reading all the commentaries from the fathers on Daniel and the second Thessalonians two and the apocalypse. Um, you know, the church very clearly says in the catechism that before the end, that there will be a final Passover, a final passion that the church goes through, um, whether we're in it or not, I'm not here to say, but, but it's, there's no doubt passions that the church goes through throughout history. And, uh, the prophecy seemed to point to an escalation of that birth pangs through history to a, an ultimately climactic one. So um, I have found through the study of typology and scripture and the fathers on these various texts, um, you know, uh, a great source of comfort. I, I think St. John and Our Lady at the cross are the model for right now. Um, and uh, if there's anything that's different now uh, from my life as a Protestant, it's the theology of suffering. I me, my fellow speechwriters of the White House, uh, the three of us who worked for the vice president, they were all Catholic, all Catholic converts, uh, which I thought was great. And I made a comment to them one time. I said, you know, I was joking, of course. But I said, you know, the one thing that sucks about being Catholic is we can't complain about suffering anymore. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's really and it's even it, it even has ecclesial implications. You know, Protestants, you know, separated from the church based on this idea that, oh, it's so bad this way or the other. Um, and, uh, but if you have a Catholic, no, there, you have to suffer and, um, and you have to like it, you know, at some point, that's of course what we're striving for. So, but, um, but anyway, those would just be some thoughts. I think St. John and Our Lady at the cross are the, are the model right now. And, um, you know, certainly, uh, we're getting close to our end here. I want to, uh, lob one more question towards, uh, Father Ripiger. Father, was, there was an interview, uh, back in September between a, um, a popular young actor who's been in, say, Padre Pio in an upcoming movie and Father Robert Barron. And this actor revealed that in the course of playing St. Padre Pio, he'd begun, um, attracted to the, the Latin rite of the mass and had begun attending mm. and had begun his conversion, of course. So not to say this is not a, a TLM versus Novus Ordo debate, but to say if there's something about the richness of our tradition and our faith history that can be used to bait Protestants to coming back into the fullness of the church that is maybe <clears throat> as yet untapped in our in our diocese. Yeah, I definitely think so. I mean, I think it's um, I think if the Protestants actually knew about the depth and the richness of the Catholic tradition, they would just be attracted to it just based on that alone. You know, and it's one of those things that uh, even as Joshua, I was happy to hear him say, you know, just just quoting the fathers itself. And I think that if we were to um, provide the Catholic faith um, whole and unencumbered without hiding any of it, without, without um, you know, apologizing in the negative sense of that term, not defending it, but I mean, in the sense of, you know, saying, oh, well, we're sorry that we actually believe that if we just just said, no, this is what we believe that and and which would be the richness of the tradition coming forth. I think that you would actually see Protestants much more attracted to it. You know, when Christ said faith comes through hearing, that's true, even in relationship to Protestants, they're going to they're going to see the attraction to the Catholic faith if they actually hear it without, you know, with clarity and with love, but without any kind of, I'm um, trying to cover it, but also with bringing the whole of it forward. I mean, it's true that the Catholic tradition doesn't necessarily have everything that's absolutely stellar, but the riches that are actually there. And I think that's true, not just, you know, in relationships to his teachings, etc. But I think that's even true in its sacramental life and our rituals and things like that, that if the Protestants actually really fully understood them, they would be very much attracted to it. Mm. Absolutely. We will leave it there. That will do us for the TAN Roundtable today. The winner of our book giveaway, John Ingalls from Alaska. Congratulations, John. You have won our trio of books, including Tradition and the Church. Wonderful copy to have before Christmas. Either keep it or give it away as a gift. If that's not you, we have a disco, discount code for everyone. Uh, add Tradition and the Church or any of our other books we've talked about today to your cart and type in the code Round table 40, and you will get 40% off your purchase. Round table 40. 
If you have any questions, please email us at talks at tanbooks.com. We'll see you next month on December 14th at noon Eastern for our next roundtable, which will be discussing communism and the Catholic Church. That's going to be a great one. We'll be talking with Dr. Paul Kangor and others about communism's diabolical roots and how it still seeks to undermine the church and the U.S. That'll be another great discussion. Father, before we go, would you mind giving us all your blessing, please? Absolutely. Benedictio de omnipotentis, Patris et Fili, et Spiritus et Supervos, et Maniat Semper. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father, and thank you both to you, Josh, and to you, Steve, and early happy Thanksgiving to everyone next week. Um, thank you to all of our viewers for turning in today and for your wonderful questions in the chat. We love giving those to our guests. We'll see you next month. God bless and take care. Mm -hmm.